two. One. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting film journey here on Inside Movies Galore. I am one of your hosts, but tonight we are continuing our holiday second chances uh, themed month, uh, where uh, we go over to Brandon's choice for tonight. So, Brandon, why don't you tell us what movie you, uh, you had us watch for this week? Yeah, I was just looking at the poster, and Bing Crosby is, does not look like Bing Crosby in the poster, or at least not the one that was in the movie. Um, <laughs> but in any case, we're, co we're covering Irving Berlin's A Holiday Inn, um, which is uh, directed by Mark Sandrich and Robert Allen in 1940. Two. This is a uh, delightful little uh, patriotic uh, film, as you could say, where uh, we have um, two, a singer and a dancer, whose act is split when the singer wishes to live the quiet life, and he founds an inn that is only open during the holidays. There will be romance, there will be music, and there will be betrayal, and just this little bit of racism. Dun, dun, dun. All right. <laughs> so um, let's uh, actually get started with seeing who has seen this film before. Um, actually, why don't we start with uh, you, Tammy? Um, is this your first time seeing Holiday Inn? No, I've seen it probably once before this time. So, um, I liked it because I, um, I like I like older movies, no matter what they are. You know, um, not just the horror movies. I like older movies and, um. Over the last few years, it seems like I've really gotten into a lot of the, um, like, Fred Astaire and um, Bing Crosby and, um, well, geez, now I can't think of everybody's name, but <laughs> I've gotten into more of more of them. And so, yeah, I really had, I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I liked the that it's got a little bit of, you know, your song and dance and comedy and drama and, you know, so I think it's, I think it's fun to watch. All right. Well, what about you, Jake? Was this your first time watching Holiday Inn? No, it was not. Um, I'm almost sure that it was a second viewing. It may have been a third <laughs> viewing. I really can't honestly swear to it, but I know I saw it a few years back, um, probably six or seven years ago. I, I feel like it's probably a third viewing because I feel like there was another one somewhere thereabouts. Um, I know I, I had to watch it partly because of the history. I mean, it is the origin of probably the most famous song ever to win original song at the Oscars <laughs> and one of the most recorded songs in history. Yep. Which Was apparently, that, uh, apparently the producers didn't even think it would be the big hit from the movie, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the um, it's an interesting movie riddled with issues that have not aged well. Uh, absolutely shot through with things that have not aged well, some worse than others. But it does feature an interesting, I don't know, is this like one of the few times that you get uh, Crosby and Astaire together? Uh, it might it's be. not the first time. It's like and definitely not the last. I think it's one of the few. I don't think yes. there are a lot of them. So they, they do play off each other really well. Yes. Um, and it's an interesting movie. Uh, it does have some great music. I mean, Irving Berlin, of course, does the music, and it does have some great songs. Uh, 
even the more problematic songs kind of sound good. Um, I am disappointed that they claim there are 15 holidays that this inn is going to celebrate. And I'm not sure about my count, but I think they only ended up doing eight, maybe nine. Am I correct about that? I don't think they even mentioned what the others were. Well, and the problem is you might count New Year's a second time, and you might count Thanksgiving. Oh, I'm know. talking about on the yearly calendar. Yeah. How many, like, I I feel confident that Halloween got skipped. Like, I'm, oh, pretty, yeah. Sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's one that they would have counted, and they just didn't bother to put it in the movie. But I want to know what the list was, because they have some weird-ass choices here. <laughs> oh yeah, I was surprised. Lincoln and Washington's birthday. Shoot, right. February was filled with times that they were opening. Right, <laughs> and of course, this movie came out before uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day would have been a thing. But uh, like, what other holidays? Like, you know, and uh, apparently day. yesterday was National Squirrel Appreciation Day. Where was the? Where was that in this movie? You know, that made for an interesting song. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so overall, yes, it's a movie that in a, it, it definitely has a major historical importance and it is fairly entertaining for the most part, but it definitely has some cringe moments. It's definitely uneven. And, um, and I'm not just talking about all the uh, racial stuff. Just the whole idea that uh, the way that Astaire max on every woman in oh, yeah. his life is just he he plays a total cad in this movie and his manager's no better. <laughs> so I was gonna say the manager was the manager made them look all nice and right. Bing Crosby wasn't even a wasn't a good guy either in this. He so, wasn't blameless, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, it's, so uh, it's it's an interesting idea. Um, it's an interesting conceit. It leaves a lot of unanswered questions. I'm glad I got to see it again. I feel like my impression this time was not that far off from my first impression. Um, I'd be curious to see what someone who grew up with this mo movie would think coming back to yeah. it. I mean, I'd be curious, but... <laughs> it would be nice to have someone who came to it from nostalgia. I don't think we have anybody here who right. saw it when they were really young and was like their favorite holiday film. Um, well, who knows? Maybe maybe it was Dave. Was this your was this your favorite holiday film growing up? <laughs> uh, no, I, I would have to say my favorite holiday film to watch was "It's a Wonderful Life." Um, uh, 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 that's the one that I was used to, and I, I I've honestly seen White Christmas a lot more than I have seen uh, 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 this one. And this one I saw, I, I I seem to remember bits and pieces of watching different clips from this movie, but I never saw the blackface part on, uh, until I actually saw it fully this time around. Well, you know, actually, on many of the TV cuts for this film, that part was cut out. So there could be a you could have seen this film without the Lincoln's birthday part, if you and even today if you watch it in the wrong on the wrong streaming service you will you will miss that one. For better for worse, I, I believe well, I, that a film like this, if you're gonna have the warts, show the darn warts. <laughs> well, the only cringe moment to me, uh, out of the whole entire th 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 thing. Uh, I was okay with the uh, the blackface because there was a reason behind, uh, uh, behind it. He didn't want her to be recognized by by, uh, by you know what's his name, uh, 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 name because he was trying to steal his girl. You know, um, wow. I, I, I get now, I get now why people in the woke generation uh, think uh, think it is a, a cringe worthy moment. Uh, don't worry, I'll be addressing this Digging more a hole. fully once we get to the scene. Digging a hole. <laughs> we will. We 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 won't get mired in it yet. We can get mired in it when we get to it in the film. <laughs> Look, um, I'm going from my uh, my uh, my viewpoint on uh, on things, and uh, uh, did I get outraged by it while watching it? 
uh, not that particular part. What I did get a little bit a bit, a bit annoyed about was the uh, the little black girl was almost topless at that one uh, at the one point, and them actually saying "darky" in the song. Okay, that part I was uh, upset with. Um, you know, <laughs> well, not, so that. That is what I was uh, uh, upset, upset, upset with when I heard, heard it. So, um, that being said, the rest of the uh, movie, I remember, I, I remember some soundtracks that I would listen to that would have on the avenue uh, on uh, on the so, uh, soundtracks. Uh, so I have heard that song elsewhere. That's the Easter song. So that uh, that yes, one I that remember. one used to be a, a big one, and we're going to also. One of the things I want to do with this one that, that we do a little bit differently is I want to cover some of the music as we go uh, because the music is so ingrained into these scenes. It would be wrong to not hit it as we go because it's a part of the story. It really is. Uh, but yes. But I, I, I guess I somewhat enjoyed... Uh, the tunes that uh, that uh, that were invo involved in some of the film, and it was interesting seeing uh, the two pair off uh, with each other. Uh, I do think that there was an underlying theme of, okay, you uh, you can dance and you can uh, uh, sing, and you can do it better, and you can oh. do that better. You know that type of thing going on. There's a lot of interesting depth in this film, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit more in my uh, my initial, but I'll also get to it when we get to it. Uh, anything else on your initial day? That's my initial uh, uh, thoughts and uh, what I thought while I was watching, uh, watching it. <laughs> so, so how about you, Dustin? Was this your first time watching Holiday Inn? So had we covered this before and this is one of our rewatches? Because it seemed kind of familiar in a weird way. Well, we have covered White Christmas before, I believe, and White Christmas sprang from this. As I was saying before, uh, before we okay. went on, actually, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, they they cut blackface from White Christmas for um, for some of the same reasons why we might feel offense at it here. Um, oh, I see. Which is good because uh, I think that was a good decision. <laughs> Because white yeah, Christmas is uh, much better today. <laughs> um, well, I am uh, not going to be kind to this. Uh, this sucked ass. Like this was so slow. Uh, I fell asleep for at least a third of it, and oh my god, this just sucked so bad. Like I like how the two lead leading men were just like mannequins. Like they were completely interchangeable. Like if I. I could not identify them if you put them like face to face. Like they looked identical. Like, oh fuck. Uh, so it was it was very hard to feel any kind of investment in this. Uh, some some of the dancing was all right. Um, like the thing where he's dancing to the firecrackers, like that was kind of cool. Um, but it was a. Uh, well, I don't know. It it reminded me of when we saw when I saw two thousand one with my friend, and we were both just bored out of our minds at uh, one of like the ten minute shots of just the ship in space where nothing happens. And so my friend went and and said, "Ugh, I can't handle this. Like, I'm gonna go take a nap. I'll be back in a little bit." <laughs> and so he left on one of the shots of the spaceship, and about forty five minutes he came back. Um. Uh, Unfortunately, during one of the other shots of the spaceship, and I'll never forget like his face and just reaction. Oh my god, nothing changed. <laughs> and this movie was very much like that. Uh, like the the opening, it's like, you know, I'm going to quit my, you know, lucrative thing. I'm gonna start a farm. It's like, well, you're a fucking idiot. And like, you know, and then it shows. There's like a little montage of like how much farming sucks, and it's like, yep, that's what you get, moron. Well, um, so no, I, I, I hate, I fucking hated this, and I, I completely missed like the blackface part, but uh, 
you know. So it was it was kind of fun uh, coming onto the show. It's like, well, I didn't know I had the blackface. It's like, uh, oh, 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 um so um but yeah this was this was this was fucking bullshit it was so bad and the, why the they past, the past sucked so bad it's so bad and, and why and why ben crosby went woke in the 19 in the 1950s <laughs> i'm not doing <laughs> that might be one of the stupidest things i've ever heard anyone say it's kind of funny but, uh, so um uh, anything else on your first impressions? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so yesterday I was trying to watch the monster movie The Barn, which has like a reputation as like a really, you know, blood and thunder, like kick ass, like creature film. And I thought I saw it on Amazon Prime. Um, so I started it up. Turns out there's a barn from the barn I wanted was the barn from 2016. And I saw The Barn from 2018, which is this insanely awful French film with, <laughs> well, the most common criticism of it was it has two plot lines that never really meet, and it's just a complete mess. And it felt like I was watching that again, because this was just kind of like, what is happening? Who are you? Like, do you have names? It's like, the whole thing is just trash, like. Oh my fucking god! Like the the firecracker tap dancing was kind of neat, um, but other than that, it's just kind of like I regret I wasted my time on it. Uh, uh, well, that's pretty much that's pretty much how I feel. Although I do have a question: uh, Is this the reason like that one ho the hotel no. franchise is called the Holiday Inn? Is it modeled after this? Like did they it get the idea from there? Is indeed. Okay, so at least it had some value of some kind. Good. Oh, I mean, there, there's multiple points of value from it. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, and just to go on your comment about French films, because I know Jake would love me to play it. A foreign film. Oh, the evening is saved. I like French films, pretentious, boring French films. I like French films. Three tickets, see vous play. Ow. <laughs> Fuck yes. Oh, that, that's... <laughs> I have that play in my head because I did watch quite a lot of The Critic, but almost nobody else seems to know about The Critic, so I can't really talk about it too much. Oh, it's okay. such a good I love you, my guy. <laughs> the Red Balloon, and it's... I, I think they play a clip of that later in that episode. And it is just a balloon going through the countryside. It's like, oh, uh, what's happening? Actually, the red balloon is oddly enough, I, I was expecting something much more pretentious than what I got. Oh. And that's that's sad, but that's true. <laughs> so and there was a uh, there was a joke on the the Up Out Trap House podcast. They were they were riffing off of foreign mm. films, and it's like, you know, it's like you know, for some reason, you know, th they were talking about this guy who was like a clown in like the 30s or whatever. And then like for some reason, like he was there were like 20 French films about the Holocaust and he was a clown in all of them. You know, just making <laughs> fun of uh, that. Uh, was it that insane Jerry Lewis project, which might actually see the light of day. Uh, kind of dreading that. But oh, I want to see it. I want to see it. More of a morbid curiosity thing because it it just sound reading the synopsis, it sounds like the most poor taste thing you could conceive of. That's Jerry Lewis. <laughs> That's just Jerry Lewis in general. <laughs> I, I, I did I did hear quite a few um, rumors to the effect that he was just like a dick. But um, with that being said, uh, speaking of poor taste, my first impression. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of this film uh this is not my first watch uh but this is supposed to be a second chance month so it'd be pretty poor if it was my first watch for this thing um so i got this because it was an oscar winner and because it is the film that got white christmas on the map um it's not white christmas uh which is uh funny um so this film has some actual importance uh, musically 
if anything, for White Christmas alone. Um, I could not stay awake the first time I watched it. I slept through. I stay. I slept so often through this film that I missed any of the parts with racism. So when people were saying this film was racist, like what? I don't remember anything like that. <laughs> yeah. But um, then I watched it the second time because again, second chances. So I watched it the second time in um, the month of December. And I won't say I watched it a third time, even though I did watch a version with the, um, with the, the commentary because it was just, you know, the commentary. But um, the second time I watched it, I actually made sure I was well awake. And uh, I did enjoy the film. Um, again, it's all about, it's like that, it's like uh, when, when uh, Kenobi is talking to Skywalker in the first movie, it's all a matter of your point of view, uh, which, you know, if you get into the film uh, expecting what you get, um, there is a lot that you can take out out of it. I overall did like this film, though, as Jake says, there are a lot of issues with it. Um, but we'll get into those as we go. Um, but I did think that uh, Ben Crosby and, da and uh, not Danny Kay, uh, <laughs> Fred Astaire are an amazing pair. Uh, they have worked, worked well together in the past and were uh, quite close friends. Um, matter of fact, uh, not long before he died, uh, Fred Astaire did an interview and he had talked about all of his times with Bing Crosby as quite, um, quite enjoyable. Um, I even found out he was even slated to be, um, Bing's, uh, partner in White Christmas instead of Danny Kay, but scheduling reasons... Nothing else, just scheduling reasons, because Astaire was involved in a lot of other projects at the time. They were the things that kept him away. So they did some rewriting of the script to put Danny Kay in it, and the rest is history. It would have been a very different film. I don't know if it would have been better or worse. I, I do love Danny Kay in White Christmas. <laughs> so I guess let's get started with this. Um the film is basically about this romantic rivalry, uh, which starts where you've got the duo, uh, Crosby and, um, and Astaire, uh, with their female um, lead uh, coming in. Between. They both like, and she likes both of them. Yep. But she and, ends up making a choice, doesn't she? Uh, she ends up liking both of them, but Astaire manages to come out on top. Which is, uh, which apparently is not something unusual in their relationship. Apparently, this is uh, not the first time that he's done this, and this is one of the things that irks um, uh, Crosby, uh, essentially, uh, because. He's like, well, every guy, every, while I'm with this partnership, it's there. So he decides he's going to retire to the farm. And this is the main catalyst that helps him. He's tired. He's stressed out. And now this girl that he likes, another one goes to a stare. And he's like, I'm done with this. I want something relaxing and stress-free. I want to go work on a farm because most people who only have had city life probably look at that as relaxing uh, when you don't know what it's about. <laughs> as we find later, as Dustin had said in that nice montage. Yeah. My, um, <laughs> my, my mom was, uh, grew up on a farm and she would tell stories about the farm. And I think to her, it was like nostalgic. It's like, Oh yeah, we would do this and we would do that. And it just sounds like, it just sounded like I can't really imagine like a worse hell. Uh, it is it is a workaholic's wet dream uh, a farm is um, because you were working the crack of dawn uh, just to go milk the cow and go, uh, go and uh, make sure that all the pastures are 
uh, taken care of. The to uh, the soil is to uh, toiled. Mm. Yeah, it, it's it's not a, it's not a great uh, life. I think the phrase "spinning your his wheels and gnashing his teeth" uh, might be a good uh, might be a good one to use to kind of describe the experience. So it's like you do all this manual labor like multiple times a day and it's supposed to get you somewhere but it seems like just never ending like no progress made like it's yeah, I don't like know. I say, it's it's a different culture and unfortunately for crosby he was not raised on a farm well sorry the character was not raised on a farm and so he didn't quite know what he was looking. He, he didn't quite know what he was getting at. But what do y'all think of this setup, basically, of kind of Astaire being that ladies' man and Crosby being fed up with it? Well, if I were in that position, I would definitely be, it'd be completely. Uh, if I if I had been interested in the uh, the, uh, the the girl that uh, Astaire was in, in, interested in. And just shunned aside like that. If farming was the only uh, place that I could go to, I guess I could see why he would go do that. But uh, but honestly, if there were other options, I might have chosen another option. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I can see why he was. Uh, uh, he he basically kind of threw himself in the hell. <laughs> you know. Uh, just because it was probably better than him just moping around and getting drunk, you know? Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, to me, Crosby comes off as just a complete fool for this, like, obviously going to fail plan. Like, I, uh, it, it immediately colored my opinion of his character as, oh, he's an idiot. Okay. Uh, well, like, if it makes sense anyways, uh, coming from somebody who grew up in the country like myself, uh, a lot of a lot of us look at people like him who have been like just in city life and they think think the whole thing is there. We look at them as fools most of the time anyway. <laughs> exactly. And mm -hmm. to like your your girlfriend who you you know supposedly care about is like, you know, I can't do that. Like either the farm or me. And it's like Oh, I'm gonna pick the farm, even though I have no experience with that, or and know nothing about it, and just insanity. Like there's, there's a another there's a Simpsons line that it's making me think of. It's like there's only one word for that: idiocy. Mm -hmm. But I think there's even a song that's sung during that time about like toil and all that stuff. Um, you know, for the montage. Yeah. We need a montage. <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely goes in uh, less than informed. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, um, and also the song at the very beginning is a great one. I think it really the song at the beginning is, a, is an excellent uh, bit of star storytelling because if you pay attention, the whole act explains the movie right then and there. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's exactly they, the plot. <laughs> the the whole stage act that they were putting on was mirroring uh -huh. the reality of what was going on with their relationships. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, that whole idea is that the girl goes with the guy who can dance. <laughs> Which is one of Crosby's fears in this as we go later on. Um, isn't it kind of ironic because, like, the uh, both of them can dance? It's kind of what they're famous for, right? Well, oh. no, Big oh, Crosby no. is known more for his crooning voice. Yeah, Crosby's always been, it's actually uh, very much to real life. Crosby has always been known for his singing. Uh, and uh, Astaire, well, Astaire is legendary. Uh, all, all of the stars back then could sing and dance. But they could not dance like uh, like a stare. <laughs> Fred Astaire was basically the Mr. Daddy Long Legs of the stage. <laughs> I, I do remember um, 
I remember this from uh, some movie trivia. So he was in some movie where they had him dance up a wall mm -hmm. doing using some sort of rotating room effect. Yes. And I, I remember that being um, talked about because that was basically what they later used for like uh, the Tina kill on Nightmare on Elm Street. So they basically just used the same rotating room. Uh, like they kind of dusted the concept off and like, I think, I think they tweaked it a little bit, but that's how that effect was done. And I remembered Fred Astaire being mentioned in like the origin of that trick. There's actually a lot of stuff here that has been well. Of course, then again, what's what's people learn from the things that uh, that they have done and advances they make. So it's, it stands to reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and of course, I believe the uh, let's see here. I'm not bashing his other work I haven't really seen, by the way. I'm just bashing this work because it was bullshit. Well, of course, one of the people, one of the actresses I do want to uh, bring up is Louise Bevers, um, who was introduced. Uh, she is the one that's kind of plays the mammy type character. And though this would be considered, and I will say there's a twofold uh, argument to that. Many people would discredit her because she's playing a part that's stereotypical. But at the same time, when those were the only parts there, you got to really, in my opinion, people should give credit where the credit's due for that. It's sort of like the um, the win for, um, not her one, but uh, it was the other one, for the win for the actress that played a similar role in Gone with the Wind. There is still quite a bit uh, of uh amazement to be had in the performance that she gave uh, so you know i mean it's good to have an actor or actress of color regardless though it was weird having the two children there <laughs> they were i think a little more problematic in some ways because they had that kind of stereotypical yeah. annoying high-pitched kid voice you know like yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I can see how I agree with you. Like she did a good job with her performance, but there mm -hmm. were some cringe moments, especially the aforementioned line that Dave uh, brought up. Okay. The one, yeah. As a uh, and language has changed quite a bit over the years as well. I mean, I I think they were. I think the. Well, the, the performance that I saw, I mean, I thought she was fine. Um, the, I, I, the, I, really saw, I, I only really remember her going like up and down stairs and being like, yep, we can do that. Or, like, uh, she had a, she had the same role that uh, they're making a, uh, they're making a romantic comedy out of now, the, uh, <laughs> which uh, I won't mention the name because it has a, a word that I can't, that I am not saying on the air. Um, or off the air, for that matter. So, uh, but yes, uh, the whole idea of assisting the main character uh, to victory, <laughs> that's not just a, uh, you know, that's not just a 80s thing, <laughs> uh, to be sure, even though the 80s and 90s made that a big thing. <laughs> um, so, but, it's, uh, but he actually goes over with uh, a stare uh, about the idea that he had about doing this in for the holidays so he could you know get away from the farming life and still do performing but do it in a small enough way that he doesn't have to do all the extra work and he can still do what he loves and then you have the whole preserve scene during that which I don't know <laughs> why but I, I, that one does crack me up the just to show how bad, by how bad he is at farming. <laughs> <laughs> As each peach preserve jar just starts going off. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot, some of it ends up on the ceiling. That, that part I kind of laughed at. What did y'all think of that concept? I mean, what do y'all think of the concept of an inn only open on the holidays, but having these massive celebrations during those times? I mean, it makes sense because I, I think there are some, I think there's a good number of real resorts that do that, right? It's like in season and out of season. Like, well, seasons, yes. That radical to me. 
Uh, the, uh, I guess the radical cool. part would be just the holiday part. Yeah. And there that, are holidays in and out of season. <laughs> and that does raise a question that I don't think was ever answered in the movie. And y'all can tell me if you think it was or not. So this is a holiday in, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which by definition means a place where people stay. Yes. And ah. as far as I can tell, their hours of operation are strictly the evenings of these holidays. That really seems to be. Now, it may just be the impression that I got from the movie and it may be wrong, but it doesn't seem like they're open the next day. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, that, that's a good yeah. point. That's <laughs> the impression I got of it is that... Yeah. They they take reservations for the night, and right. then basically you stay the night to sleep off the long night of partying for the holiday. <laughs> and that would make sense. Um, but the way he talks, he makes it sound like he's going to be working 15 days a year. And the other thing is, even if they do it that way, like you just described, even if they are open on the holiday and for the next day until their guests leave, and that's it, there is no way you can have a functional inn on 30 days a year. It is not possible. He would probably have to put in a full month and additional work just to keep the place running and to, here's the big thing, how does he afford it? How does he afford those big shows just on the people who show up for that day? He would have to be charging an arm and a leg to do that. So, like, the economics of the movie make no freaking sense whatsoever. It's like, it, it's a good concept, but the way it's presented here is totally unrealistic. It becomes a he dystopian holiday shack for the elite. He would have had to have been running that in besides ha having uh, these events happen, just not doing the whole catering aspect of the events, you know, where it would be like a bed and breakfast type of deal, you know, right. where, where people would spend the night, have a breakfast that was cooked by, uh, by, you know, his servants. And then, you know, they would go on their merry way, you know. Uh, and again, I, I also kind of thing going on, but, but they didn't exactly specify that. Yeah. I also said, like I said before, I'd be curious to know what the list of holidays actually is. Cause like, we know that there, there's no way they would not have something for Halloween, but that was skipped in the movie. I'm willing to wager that uh, Labor Day was probably one of them. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know the dates that Labor Day, Memorial Day, or Veterans Day came into effect. So I don't know which of those, if they all predate this or not. Maybe some of y'all do. So, but what are the others? They skipped April Fool's Day. That would be a great opportunity yeah. to do a show. <laughs> and again, I guess they only had time for so many songs. So, right. Um, uh, gosh, what is the name of her? It is Reynolds. Reynolds. Um, so it looks like Labor Day became a federal holiday in 1894. Let's see here. Yeah. Uh, it would have been, well, actually, a 42 would have been hard to say what what they would have thought. Uh, but, yeah, Labor Day was more of a individual state thing in the beginning. Um, oh, Marjorie Reynolds. So we're introduced to Marjorie Reynolds' character um, also, which I think is an interesting introduction because she waylays their, uh, their agent. Who is the slime? Who is a very slimy dude? The guy who plays him does an excellent job of creating a very slimy character out of him. Um, but basically waylays him, and his his thing is like, well, th th there's this guy over uh, out of a farm who's trying to open a Holiday Inn, looking for work, and which is how she ends up um, trying to break into show business by uh, running into Crosby that way around Christmas time. And that's where we get our first performance of White Christmas. 
Now, something interesting about that is that the original uh, idea for the White Christmas was not to be sung by Bing Crosby at all, but was going to be sung after the movie had moved on later by Reynolds. And we'll get to that part later. But that was the, uh, they were going to make it uh, be, uh, have an entirely different tone for the movie. Whereas here it's kind of more whimsical as he's talking about his idea with her about what they're going to do. Um, maybe with a little bit of that first start to romance. Um, but um, what are y'all's thoughts about White Christmas's actual debut? Because this was its debut. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I, I really have no opinion on it. Well, I do like the fact that uh, that the, uh, he rings the, those four bells on the Christmas tree. The type of th uh, th thing which he later mir mirrors or mimics later. That's how she knew it was him right away. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a very interesting introduction. Um, and they kind of repeated it uh, in White Christmas, I think, with the Counting Your Blessings number, um, the kind of, you know, romantic by the piano sort of thing. Um, but like I said, I'd read that apparently Irving Berlin uh, didn't think this was going to be the big hit from the movie. There was another, I think it was the, oh, what's the other one called? The, On the Avenue? The what? On the Avenue? No, um, I'll. No, it's not that one. The Easter one? <laughs> Actually, no, the Easter one was already a hit. Never mind. No, the, uh, Be Careful, It's My Heart. That's yeah. the one he thought was going to be the big hit. Which was um, a big hit. <laughs> yeah, it was a good song, too. But, like, this, uh, I, I just found that kind of interesting to read that. But personally, I think it's a nice little scene. Yeah. You know, it's a good, good little moment between the two of them. Yeah, according to what it was I back really, Oh, go ahead, Tammy. I really enjoyed the White Christmas um, introduction to Young. You know, I, thought, I thought it was sweet, you know, how he's like, this is a song I wrote, and then he starts just singing it, and then starts bringing her into it and everything. I thought it was a really neat, sweet, you know, a, a sweet scene. And it was Bing Crosby that kind of, that uh, kind of championed the song through because he thought it had a lot of potential. He didn't. He was surprised that it got as big as it did. I think most people would tell you the truth, but um, he he had said that I don't know why y'all putting down this song so much. It's actually really good. This is going to be a big. It's going to be a big song. And everybody's like, nah. <laughs> so I do find that funny. My, my guess is it's probably like one of what maybe three or four Christmas songs that existed at the time, and it just got licensed early on. Well, it did win the Oscar for best song, original song. So, man, they just gave those things away to anybody in those days, didn't they? Eh, I consider White Christmas. I understand. I mean, you gotta you gotta put yourself back into that type that time. For instance, our modern music, they would hate that. They look at that as trash. I kind of look at modern music as trash too, kind of these days. But depends on the genre. But again, it's it's like I say, music is all there. The White Christmas has held up for years. I mean, decades. Uh, so I can't really knock it. It's it is to me. It does definitely deserved its win. Um, My, I would be very curious to see uh, if it drops off after. Um, people in a certain age group expire enough. It's hard to say. I've heard a lot of young people do still play it during the Christmas season. It's mm -hmm. again, it's, it's all dependent. <laughs> what, what hangs on, in my opinion, what hangs on really does depend. Like there's a lot of songs that I really like that were very big favorites back in the day that are long gone and out of the lexicon, even though they would be considered appropriate or popular at, at this time many of those will be gone it's it's all about uh, it's all about what the staying power is i mean it's not just the people who originally heard it in the 40s most of those people are gone <laughs> uh, 
But with that song being as popular as it is, it's still popular with people in their 20s and 30s today. So, I mean, it's not like played at dance clubs or anything, but I don't think it was played in dance clubs back then either. <laughs> so, If songs that you like or you heard uh, as a child and uh, were passed on to you by your your parents or or uh, or you know others and you pass them down to your kids you know the, the, and then it's very possible generations beyond us might be able to hold a candle to some of these earlier uh songs from these earlier periods so and that's that's what i personally think it could be a big factor with uh, some things like that it's like oh this was grandma's favorite song and we play it at christmas uh, to remember her, like I can, I can easily, easily see that being uh, the case. But uh, the further people get from those memories over time, like that was, that was kind of more what I had in mind when I said that. Like uh, I say, it's all, it's all about things. I mean, almost all of the Christmas songs are dated. I mean, oh uh, my I'm lord! Sure, yes. I'm sure there will be people like forty years from now looking at Mariah Carey's song and going gosh this is trash why do people listen to it uh you know it's uh it's all there you know <laughs> you know i mean it's the season too i mean this is stuff that you exactly hear whether you like it or not like it's you know playing in the background at target or whatever you know like you can't really get away from it and and because of that it associates a feeling and a lot of the feelings are, are good not always but there are a lot of them that are good but that's nostalgia <laughs> and that's psychology but um their first big uh their first big uh th actually hold on uh okay their first big holiday open was new year's which is i guess an appropriate kickoff to a holiday inn if you think about it um and of course astaire shows up drunk because uh his dance partner split with him and married some rich dude. Um, so he's all broken up about it. And he ends up having this dance off with uh, Reynolds. And uh, it's so well done that they're like, uh, that. no, this has got to be my new dance partner. If you want to know something funny about this, um, this scene was actually performed by a stare drunk. He actually was inebriated in the scene. He said that he wanted to, because he was his character was supposed to be drunk in the scene, that he wanted to be a little bit inebriated. So he would take two strong drinks between takes. The one we're seeing is the seventh take. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. But it, that just also goes to show you the level of discipline and rhythm that he had, that he, his body was going on autopilot. <laughs> Which made it look more real, to be honest. Yeah, he looked drunk because he was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Method acting. <laughs> but what did y'all think of the drunken dance scene? <laughs> I honestly... It great. Go, go ahead. It's interesting. I thought it was great. You know, you see, he, I didn't know what you just said, so I thought he was... You know, playing it very good, you know. <laughs> now we'd come to find out that he actually was drunk, but I mean, um, I don't think I could have danced that well or done anything that well if I would have been as drunk as he was. <laughs> so I thought it was amusing, and it was, you know, shows it shows him also as an actor, I guess, that he could perform that well, you know. Especially now, knowing that he really was. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that that's that's something. Uh, I mean, talent. And again, whenever I say talent, uh, I don't really associate a person's moral moral views or anything like that. I'm not saying anything <laughs> against the stairs views. I don't know them, but talent is something that is still amazing to see, and he's amazing to watch. And uh, we we see several scenes that showcase that that talent that even to this day, I don't think that there are dancers that have lived up to that level. Um, there's some that have come close, but I don't know if there's been any that have been quite quite as good. 
And we are never going to see any type of major like uh, films about Astaire or anything like that because of his di because of his dying wishes. <laughs> yeah. He didn't want any biopics about, made about him, or he didn't want anything. He didn't want anything bearing his name. He didn't want anything about him after his death. You got my old films. You got the back catalog. That's it. <laughs> that's odd. He didn't want his uh, name to be made into a mockery, essentially. Hmm. I think, actually, Jacob, you might know more than I do about that. No, that's about what I know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but of course, you know, uh, Astaire gets put to bed and the uh, agent's looking for, for of course, uh, Reynolds' Uh, but uh, Bing is doing a good job hiding her. <laughs> and Astaire essentially is like, well, I will just keep coming back to this end and even performing here until I see, find her, essentially. Um, which I think is a, a very interesting way of doing it. He was like, nah, I, I love a first sight. Has to be this person. She's got to be my dance partner. Um, and they also had like that song, like, um, let's start the new year, right? Which was also a pretty nice song at the time. I thought it was a good, good send off. And it was considered pretty uh, big at new year's at the time for a while. Um, what are y'all's thoughts on new year's? Because once we get through New Year's, we got a lot to cover for this particular next. <laughs> it's good. It's good. What was your question again? Your thoughts on the New Year's thing and as as a whole. I thought it was good up to that point. Well, you know, we might as well get to this and get it done. Lincoln's birthday. I knew there was going to be trouble as soon as Bing Crosby said, you know what? I think we got to do this in blackface. <laughs> but uh, let me run through this real quick and then uh, then get y'all's commentary. Is that an actual line? Yes. Oh, dear Lord. And as, as Dave was saying, uh, they knew Astaire was going to be in the crowd, so he decided to do it in that, fa in that manner. Um to uh, make sure she was unrecognizable, and Lord Almighty, she was unrecognizable. Um, let me see if I can find a picture. I'll show y'all what I mean. Uh, <laughs> but while I'm doing that, let me run down a little bit about this uh, so that I can bring that. Yes, actually, that is perfectly good right there. Um, I will copy that and let you all see this real quick so that you can see what I mean. I'm gonna post this inside the uh, inside our group chat real quick so you can see it. Uh, so you can take a quick peek about that. <sighs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Crosby almost you could say is almost tasteful in it, but not no Reynolds. Oh my God! Um, so Lopsy and Mopsy from Lovecraft County. Also, all of the band and all of the staff were uh, white actors and actresses wearing blackface. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that before we get into the song Abraham. Um. Though it might have been considered quite normal for actors to do this. And uh, almost all of the actors on there had probably performed in blackface before, including Astaire. It was actually considered something that it was kind of something that if you were singing a song and dance, you had to have done it at one point in time. Uh, the notions that none of this was considered racist is kind of a fabrication. Um. Historically, the minstrel shows, which is where that kind of dawned out, were a way actually used to mock people of color and actually a clever way of pushing the concept of the 
uh, stereotypes of being of laziness, ignorance, hypersexuality, and all of this, which are unfortunately stereotypes that have stuck today. A lot of the things that people think about people of color uh, in the negative sense came from those times and those menstrual shows. Um, so they knew very well uh, that this was what this was. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the 1950s, blackface had been phased out entirely as most people knew what it was, but quietly decided not to acknowledge it publicly. Um, but that being said, I'm trying to play both sides of this. Bing Crosby has some reputation of being racist, but he also has a reputation of, uh, of also helping the community as well. So it's kind of a weird uh, dichotomy. Uh, he's worked. He worked with a lot of actors of color, including when he was really young, um, playing at their clubs, uh, trying to learn, trying to get this. One of his best friends for the longest time was Louis Armstrong, who he'd actually helped get into a lot of areas of business, and even helped him get into into the movie business. Um, it's said that he even had a part in trying to get some of the actors of color in the film. So there's a lot of yays and nays about this. So with all that background, <laughs> uh, what are y'all's thoughts on Lincoln's birthday? <sighs> well, and, and, and looking at Reynolds's outfit, oh my God. <laughs> there definitely were some things they should have reconsidered or scrapped altogether. Um, some, of the, some of the lines in the song... I believe this was one that had that one line, the darky yeah. line. That was unfortunate. Uh, and all the blackface, ugh. But <laughs> other than a couple of the lyrics, the song actually is kind of a cool sounding song. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely uh, a good example of um, our overly patriotic revisionist style ways of looking at some of the former presidents, but it, so it's a mixed bag. It's one of those ones that I didn't like, I didn't want to like it as much as I did, but while I like the song, uh, the sequence was cringe. <laughs> God, yes. <laughs> I put my 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 uh, my my writing and comment was comically horrid. <laughs> uh, what about the rest of y'all? This was one of the things I was asleep for, so uh, I'm gonna go back and watch it later just <laughs> to be sure. But uh, like, how about we talking? Like, um, I've been rewatching a lot of Boondocks. Like, are we talking like an Uncle Ruckus song or? I mean, was, <laughs> I, I think that, Uncle Ruckus would absolutely be on yeah. board with this song. <laughs> absolutely. It's actually tame by his standards, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It still does celebrate Abraham Lincoln freeing the slaves. <laughs> Tammy, what did you think about the, uh, 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 the uh, Abraham Lincoln birthday song? Um, let's see. I don't know. I, I, I guess I basically looked at it as at the time it was just supposed to be entertainment. You know, I, just, I guess I just didn't really read a whole lot into it as to the lyrics or anything because they were supposed to be putting on a show and entertaining, you know, and making everybody laugh and have a good time, you know? So I guess that's the way I took it. I mean, you know, I guess I, I don't get into this whole thing, you know, of, I do, I do think that it was wrong at the time to not use actual, uh, <coughs> actors of color because 
I don't like stereotyping and prejudice and all that stuff. You know, so I think it was wrong that they that if you're trying to portray somebody that is black in a in a movie, you should have a black person, not dress yourself up to look like one. I don't I don't agree with that. Um You know, if you're, I guess, I kind of see it a little bit both ways. If you're, if you're trying to do like a fun skit or whatever, I can see using the makeup and doing that. But if you're trying to do, you know, like uh, maybe something like, like on Carol Burnett's show and you're doing like a skit, okay? But you're doing a movie, a whole movie. You should actually use the real, real actors that are of color, you know? At it, least for the at least for the people waiting the tables and in the band anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, and if they were, if they, if, though, <clears throat> now this, this just this part of the entertainment was supposed to be fun and everything. Fine, I guess I could see just the two of them being in the being in it, but like you said, then the rest of them shouldn't have been in the makeup. You know, it's just um. Oh, I've got a lot of mixed feelings about it because, you know, until, uh, you know, the, the last few years, everything has come up so much about this, you know, you know, Aunt Jemima couldn't be on the <laughs> syrup bottle anymore. Uncle Ben's couldn't be on the rice anymore. And, you know, and all these different, all these different movies and books and everything and all the controversy that has come up so much in the last few years is just i don't know it, it, it's just it's things that i never would have thought of or never would have paid attention to that way or never would have made it think that way you know so it makes me wonder if They were, I, I, I don't think they were thinking ahead when they made this movie that it could cause a problem later on. You know, I don't, I don't think they really set out to cause a problem by doing this. It wasn't very long. It, the funny thing is, is it wasn't very long in the future that people started seeing it as problematic. Like I said, even by the 50s, they saw it as problematic enough to sweep it under the rug, which that's, like I said, it's just, it's interesting. I, I will say that one thing that I find is a weird thing is to have an entire holiday celebration about the greatness of freeing the slaves, but not have a, a single person of color there. Except for the cook. <laughs> Except for, Except for the one, yeah. a couple of servants that, uh, that are serving dr uh, drinks among the guests. Not even yeah. them; they're all white and blackface. Oh, yeah, except, oh. well, it was only the cook and her <laughs> only the cook and her two children were actually yeah. of color. You know, like I said, that that's what just strikes me as off and odd is that you you do all that, <laughs> but is it really there? It just uh, I. Like, I I agree with that sen uh, sentiment that uh, that there should have been uh, people of color presenting uh, 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 behind uh, the idea of Link uh, 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 Lincoln at, le at least. But uh, then again, it probably not, might not work for uh, for, uh, for the the script of uh, uh, the fact that he was trying to hide her from uh, hide uh, hide his girl from being you know uh, taken from him uh by, by fred astaire's character you know i i'm not sure how they would would have worked that in without it and again it's a it's a very well actually come to think of it the movie did do without it in many cuts it, it just cut it out <laughs> uh it was only it was only restored not too long ago um, if you watch this thing on TV at any time, that scene would have been cut out entirely. Um, I guess I'm I also that, by the way. I am. 
I think that any scene, I think that people should see what is problematic about something like that, but I do think that it has a right to exist. And that's how, that's where I land on it. I don't think, uh, I don't think that we should erase um, things of the past. I think we should remember uh, every, everything that has gone on before. That's it. Like, we're in agreement in that. In that. Uh, in yeah, that. I, I do agree with that too. Uh, like it's especially. I mean, there are examples of things that are like less bad than this that you can kind of point to. Um, like I think Back to the Future is probably one of the more well-known like examples. Like for a while after 9/11, they cut out like the word terrorist from it and just kind of like chopped it up a lot. And it um, it kind of makes having discussions about the movie a little harder because it's like you know which one did you see you know or I mean I'm sure there's been some writing on like the politics like of the era and you know, talking about that scene. And without that in there, you know, it'd be like, wait, I have to find the unedited version to, you know, see what this discussion is about. So uh, that's kind of my stance on it, too. It's just sort of um, not great. Like, maybe just be careful not to sound like you're maybe kind of, like, celebrating it or being like, oh, oh Mark, it's in there. It's like, and they, they, and sometimes it can sound like uh, people are invested in something for like the wrong reasons. So. Oh, yeah. If, if you're not looking for racism, you probably don't see it. At least at first. Well, uh, I, 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 that's true. I think some people are blind. Uh, some people who aren't affected by it can be blind to it. I mean, you could have somebody being beaten down next to you, and maybe for no reason, but if you don't investigate it, then, hey, that person probably deserved it. It's, again, it's all, it's all about perspectives. Um, to me, it really, it really, to me, the people who should be looking at this and seeing the racism or not, it's not really you or me. It should be the people who are affected by this. And if they say it's bad, then I, I'll go with what they say. Uh, but, but, but believe it or not, many are not as many are many would look at that as uh, so yeah, so that that I think is really the perspective to look at it through. Because I do well, think I, that I can, tell, I can tell you that you know my great grandparents really got into these movies and everything. And I know that neither one of them ever would have thought watching this movie that there was anything racist in it, you know, because that's, that's not how they looked at the movie. And that's not, you know, that's not how they looked at things, you know, huh? even my I mean, best, even my best friend, Deb, her favorite, you know, actor or whatever is Fred Astaire. That generation did not analyze the uh, uh, things to death. <laughs> No, and again, it's all dependent. It's uh, one could say that, that 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 generation also it was normal to treat people as second class citizens because of the color of their skin, and that wasn't considered, you know, and that was considered fine. What it doesn't mean that it was necessarily right. Right. I mean, that's. Um, I, I'm trying to think of like a really clear example, like. Slave owners probably did not did not think that they were that they themselves were racist. Let's put it that way. No, it's like this was just normal. This is this is how it's supposed to be, and it's like <laughs> no, it's not. But uh, like I I don't want to say they didn't know better because in those days there were people that did know better. Uh, exactly. Well, yeah, like, there are people who fought against it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like uh maybe a better example would be cops investigate selves determine they did nothing wrong <laughs> but like i say uh the people affected should be more the ones to judge these if i'm looking at people yelling about something and it's a uh, and it's just a bunch of uh, young uh white people i i gotta wonder i, I want to know what the uh, you know what the actual what people affected actually think because <laughs> right 
nobody deserved to have their voice taken. As a bunch of white people discuss this. <laughs> 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 but uh, but I did want to have this up just as because it is a conversation and it does not need to, and it should not be erased. It should be addressed because it is a part of the film for better or for worse. <laughs> but this does end with Bing declaring his love for Reynolds, his character. Yep. But let's move on to Valentine's Day, and let's leave all the racism behind <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and, <laughs> holiday that's problematic for other reasons. But uh, the the song "Be Careful, It's My Heart" was a big hit, and it is a beautiful song. Berlin is an amazing composer, um, and Astaire finally does get to dance with Reynolds behind Bing's back. I love the effect with them jumping through the big paper heart because that has not only a cool symbolism uh, as far as just a cool effect, but also it has a cool amount of symbolism of Bing's heart being broken by the event. Um, and of course, once that's done, he's trying to win her over to come to Hollywood with him. Uh, she doesn't want to leave the Holiday Inn and he's like, well, fine. Then I'm going to sit here and not perform with you until you decide differently. <laughs> <laughs> Which could be problematic, too. <laughs> but, you know. Um, <laughs> the fucking Barbie movie. Let me play the guitar <laughs> at you. <laughs> I want to push you around. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, damn, I'm okay. <laughs> this was more accurate than I thought. But it was a really cool. Uh, it was a really cool dance number, and I love the song. I mean, it is a great song. But what do y'all think of the Valentine's Day? I thought it was cute. I thought it was romantic. Um, the song was cool. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not something that I would necessarily listen to for first day on a regular basis, but uh, I, I thought it was cute for the time. Going once, going twice. Yeah, Tammy, what did you think about the Valentine's <laughs> Day thing? I thought it was cute. Uh, okay. And so. Sweet. <laughs> uh, let's see. Was I the only one who uh, who noticed the, the whole uh, heart thing when they jumped through? Uh, I noticed it. Uh, I mean, I thought that uh, that transition was pretty cool for, uh, for the uh, uh, to represent the, uh, the Valentine's Day, uh, Day holiday. Of course, I've also uh, heard the Valentine's uh, 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 Day being a white person's holiday. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what my co-workers would tell, uh, uh, tell me while I was working at Popeye's. Being the only white person working there. Uh, hmm. all right. Well, I'd never heard that one, but the only thing I've ever heard about it is that it's a waste of uh, it's a waste of money, and uh, well, economically uh, predatory. <laughs> uh, if I that, I was gonna be like, "Damn, who'd you work with, Robert E. Lee?" Fuck. <laughs> Uh, but um, we also go to the uh, Washington's birthday because apparently February is where all the holidays are. Um, with the song "I Can't Tell a Lie," of course, that's done, when I was born. So, <laughs> all done in like a colonial garb. Uh, of course, uh, Astaire is bragging to Crosby that he's going to kiss her in this scene, and Crosby like, "Hold my beer." <laughs> As he changes up the tempo like a billion times <laughs> during the song, creating quite a comedic uh, moment throughout. What did y'all think of this whole scene? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of interesting. And I was kind of like, hey, you know, maybe that's not the best thing to do from a we're trying to entertain an audience perspective. But in terms of uh, 
needling his uh, friend and keeping him on it, literally keeping him on his toes. It was pretty well, yeah, cool. Every time he swooped in for a kiss, he would change up the tempo. Also shows, uh, actually, not just the stairs, but Reynolds' uh, mastery of dance for them to be able to keep up like that. That was a, uh, so it was pretty cool to see that. Um, apparently, by the way, uh, apparently Aster hates Colonial Garb, or hated, because he's not living with it anymore, but uh, so much so that uh, he actually would um, kick the powdered wigs. Uh, he, the last one he was in, he actually threw a powdered wig, like, uh, at a camera during a screen thing, because he hated it so much. <laughs> but um other than that uh i thought it was a really good scene it really um i thought it really hit that skill of those actors and actresses uh dancing especially the lead too uh let's see here and then we go to easter where we see them exiting church and the song that was made famous and for the longest time was almost as famous as White Christmas, which was Easter Parade. But uh, we don't really hear about Easter as much these days, except for in the, the religious circles. And, and Reese's and, and Cadbury. We, we, we do definitely hear from them. It's the this. candy holiday. Like, the not fun one. Well, I guess it all depends on one. I, I can't really say that. My my favorite candy is an Easter candy. So. I was gonna say I really, even though my teeth don't like them, I really like Cadbury eggs, and I really like the East the uh, the Reese's eggs. I don't know why. Oh, I like the Reese's wild. eggs, and I like the Cadbury chocolate eggs. I don't like the ones with marshmallow in it. <laughs> it's the Cadbury mini eggs for me. Those are those are my favorite by a lot. Like I always buy way too many of those every Easter. Peeps, peeps. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like peeps. That, that is the time of year for them, indeed. All sorts <laughs> of flavors nowadays, including peep flavored sodas. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of kind of underwhelming, yeah. I like peeps, and I like anything with dark chocolate. Dark chocolate yeah, would be great. Like they they those mini eggs come in dark chocolate now, and it's pretty uh, it's pretty awesome. They're addictive, little guys. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else to say about Easter? There wasn't really a lot there. There was a little tit for tat between Astaire and Bing, but it didn't seem like a lot more than that. I did think it was kind of romantic, romantic that they were in a um, in a carriage while singing it. You know, a little bit. But other than that, I have a. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure how to best present this, but um, so I watch a lot of political commentary, and there was there's one where. Uh, So the, the commentator I'm watching is like, you know, making fun of like how dismissive like some some person is being of uh, like somebody's argument. And it's like, yeah, look at him go. He's just like boring, 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 gay, boring. And it's like, I could not help but think of that many, many, many times as I watch this movie. Uh, so it's like, I don't know, where's... Were there any, any like, rumors or whatever that Fred Astaire and, like, Crosby might have been, um, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just talking crazy. Oh, there have been rumors about Danny Kaye, but I don't know about the others. <laughs> well, Danny Kaye was actually cool. Like, I'm, I like Danny Kaye. Oh, uh, yeah, Danny Kaye never really had a lot of bad things said about. Crosby was a kind of a, a split uh, he was a mixed bag because he's had he had a lot of negative about him but he's also had a lot of positive about him and then you got to go into like his past in his 20s he was a 
he was actually considered a rebel. A lot of the music he was singing was actually considered uh, the counter generate counter culture music at the time. So he was, uh, and he was big into drugs and alcohol for a while. But by the time he got to this movie, he was um, uh, abstinent of all that. Obviously not a steer. <laughs> uh, nope. I always thought Fred Astaire was always very, very thin throughout his entire career. Well, a dancer. <laughs> well, that, but he, he definitely was a very thin man. Yeah, I mean, you got to eat a lot if you're a dancer uh, to not burn it all off because you're constantly moving. And for him... He, he'd had to have been dancing constantly. He was a very talented man. Uh, I do I do and have watched many of uh, Astaire's films, and there is a lot of talent in his, in the way he dances in m most of his earlier films. The, I can't really say say that I entirely, liked mo uh, most of his dancing in here because i didn't see most of his trademark uh d uh, dancing moves that i know him no. for you know well let's move to one where uh this one that would be considered one of the most important dance scenes of his career as we move to july 4th oh and patriotism wave the flag because this had multiple uh, meanings. So, uh, as you may recall, uh, the year of this film is 1942. A, a little thing in history was happening during this time, just a minor event in, in history time. Um, and during the filming of this, around this time, uh, a small event that nobody ever heard of, you know, an event uh, called Pearl Harbor happened. <laughs> So, you know, uh, so the United States was gearing up for war. Now, I'm not talking about like when this released, but when it was filmed. Um, and uh, so the song, let's say it with firecrackers, was a blatantly uh, propaganda song. Uh, the montage was actually edited with the blessings of, uh, of well, the nation itself and given that was freshly filmed uh, by the government and given to them to edit into this song because they needed to stoke up patriotism, which makes sense because that's, that's a nightmare of a war to get into. And it was. Um, and of course, both Crosby and Astaire did perform on the enemy lines well for our troops of course but <laughs> um and uh both of them performed separately but uh there was a, uh, and i know but they did have run-ins uh as they went through europe so that was kind of an interesting look there of course uh that's the song let's say with firecrackers but we also have one of fred astaire's uh, uh more significant dance routines which Dustin did point out, where uh, he did the uh, firecracker dance with live firecrackers. There were a few little extra bangs and sounds that were added in uh, post-filming, but um, Fred Astaire practiced this so much, uh, he ran through this 38 times before there was a take that he was uh, happy with. So, I like the firecracker dance. I thought it was awesome. I was just trying, I, to, figure, I was trying to figure out how he was lighting up. <laughs> it's actually even used today to teach dance. Uh, that's how important it is. That that particular routine. I was impressed by it because you can tell he's really doing it. But uh, I still couldn't figure out how he was lighting up. <laughs> <laughs> he had 38 times to practice. <laughs> was he lighting them, or um, were they a kind where when you just, like, smack them against something, that would do it? 
He had to light the big one, I know, at the end. But I think the others you could just throw down and... And they'd pop. Oh, yeah, the popper ones. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, when you see you saw him grab actual firecrackers out of that bag mm -hmm. that had to be lit, uh, you know, before he went on stage. That's why I said I was wondering how he lit them because mm -hmm. what he grabbed out of that bin was, you know, the ones that had to be lit. Uh, does anybody remember him having a cigarette during that scene? Yes, yeah, he did. I think so. Is that how he did? <laughs> Oh, there, there's your answer. <laughs> but you never saw him. The cigarette stayed in his mouth the whole time. That's the thing is, it's, and of course, there's, there's a bit of movie magic and all that to be had there. I, I even said to David, I said, how is he lighting them? Because <laughs> if, if the cigarette would have been in his hand, I could have seen that. But it, no, it was in his mouth the whole time. Till he I imagine what. He was and, throwing and, down at the ground it was fairly similar to the pop bags that uh, that you would find in like American Science and Sir uh, Plus at least here uh, or you know in in any fun well, shop. I you know? know what those are. I my mm -hmm. friends and I got in trouble in school for throwing them at the chalkboard. <laughs> I imagine they're similar to that type of thing. You know, right, uh, yeah, Brandon? That's what I would think. Um, Except uh, these ones seemed like they had more of a spark. But then, of course, they, they also had multiple ones going off, so it was kind of like watching fireworks. <laughs> according to what, according to the historian on the uh, on the commentary, it is still considered one of the most intricate dance routines, uh, dance scenes, ever put on film. So, it's. Uh, which I guess it had to be for it to be that take that much to get it right. Um, but yeah, but actually, you want to know the mystery I want to know about is how is it that Reynolds's hair was perfectly in place after it got dunked in that lake when she uh, <laughs> they right? they remembered to keep her clothes wet, but they did not remember to not have her hair combed out perfectly for the scene. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to be fair, I did like uh, I like the uh, the, uh, the lake uh, scenes where where the dude that ended up take, uh, taking her uh, and getting her stuck by the shortcut to the shortcut. Yeah, double cross and triple cross. <laughs> Things set it up to where she was going to be out of the picture and he called the old dance partner to come back in uh, and try and convince Astaire to get the heck out with her. Um, but uh, Reynolds found out, drove her in the lake and really and truly uh, Bing throws in the towel like way too easily as they go to Hollywood. Um, and this kind of ends that whole like double cross constant thing. But uh, just out of curiosity, what are y'all's thoughts? Well, I wanted to check on something on this whole, uh, on this, on just the whole like kind of devious nature of Bing Crosby trying to keep her away from uh, Fred Astaire. You should have let her have her ch her choice. It is her life. Uh, I mean, he was trying to. You can. He was trying to be selfish. I think you can fully understand where he's coming from, given what his uh, former partner has done to him before. But he clearly isn't very good at it either. <laughs> and well, yes, giving her a choice is definitely the better way to go. He also uh, doesn't do what a woman expects a man to, uh, to do, uh, which is fight for that love. You know, some yeah. some ladies love it when a when a man uh, go, uh, goes and fights for them, stands uh, 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 and likes to hear, you know, all, all the uh, the uh, the emotions that a man feels. You know, so uh, and he didn't fight for the other lady. And he didn't fight for her, not at least, not as, not as much as 
you might think, you know. Yeah, I think he gave up like way too easy. She even was kind of looking at like, aren't you gonna like, you know, ask me to stay? <laughs> it's like, no, no, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. But of course, uh, the Hollywood producers do see her and they offer this whole thing and they want Bing to uh, write the music for it because he's a big songwriter as well as singer. And he says, I'll write them here. Um, and, uh, this leads to the whole, like, um, montage, montage of them doing the Hollywood and, Originally, this is where White Christmas would be performed. After that montage, Reynolds was supposed to be staring out, missing the snow, missing uh, Bing Crosby in the farm, and uh, singing White Christmas for the first time. So, so what do y'all think? Do y'all think that uh, this would have been a better uh, time to have that as the debut of it? Or do you think that the current seems to have been better it's probably fine i think it's okay where it is i mean she half sings it there um to kind of have like a uh a, a reprise of the white christmas just a little bit but enough enough to realize that big Crosby was right the heck there you know oh and, and there was there was a labor day routine as well uh it was actually a part of that so hey <laughs> i think it's fine the way they did it you know bringing it having it when they originally had it then kind of like bringing it back so so of course time passes what do y'all think of the little cartoon turkey thing with uh with uh thanksgiving with the nice. turkey i like that going over there thanksgiving's in one place then he's trying to hunt down thanksgiving in another place <laughs> yeah that was that was kind of cool now do y'all know do y'all know why that why they did that <laughs> with the turkey getting confused about when thanksgiving was no well it was roosevelt's fault it was that pe those pesky Democrats. <laughs> it was a, uh, because apparently in 1941, when this thing was there, uh, Thanksgiving was actually held on the third Thursday instead of the fourth. Uh, Roosevelt tried to switch it permanently as a way of trying to cause uh, an economic boost or shopping boost. Right. Which... You know, it's kind of funny if you think about that when you're when you're looking at this, you know, party wise. But uh, apparently, most states did not like switching away from that, and everybody got confused, and they switched it back the next year to the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the whole reason they had the weird, confused turkey scene, which I think would leave most Americans, including myself, confused. Well, yeah, change anything about anybody's way of doing things throughout the year, and it's like a domino effect. It would mess with anybody. <laughs> hmm. And of course, you get to see Crosby play almost MST3K with his own uh, with his own song. I've got plenty to be thankful for, <laughs> as he does his own like snide commentary to it. Uh, it's nice having a whole turkey to yourself. True. That was a big turkey that he had. Uh, but this is where the housekeeper truly does her little shine, uh, where she basically puffs him up and gets him uh, and brings him out of his depression and feeling sorry for himself and has him go to fight for his uh, girl. And, uh, and that's the example of a trope I will not be talking about here. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, okay. It took it took me quite a quite a minute to realize what that was. I was like, what? Oh, yeah, you know now. <laughs> uh. Uh, it's uh, it's like. Uh, yeah, it's like that scene in Gran Torino where he uses like some of like the old timey like terms, and the people are just like, "What?" and like takes them a minute. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do get to go back to Christmas Eve again, where uh, Bing shows up uh, right as Astaire is going to ask um, Reynolds to marry him. And they have a comedic scene, like, right out of, like, the Three Stooges almost there, where they try to lock him in the closet, but they don't realize that it's a two-door closet. <laughs> so, Bing, so Bing slips out the other end that they left unlocked, slips out of the, slips out of the dressing room and locks them in. <laughs> Which I thought was uh, clever, so that, he can use, so that he can refrain White Christmas and win back the heart of the girl he loves. And he does, and it is a cute, uh, a cute scene. And then, of course, you get, uh, get them to uh, come in and be like, "How did he, uh, uh, he do that under five minutes? I just don't understand." <laughs> and he won her heart again with song. <laughs> And then of course they have a, uh, I, I think they kind of have a reprise of their beginning song mm -hmm. at the at their uh, New Year's party, which um, which is back at the end. It's actually kind of funny, by the way, that the soundstage that they built in Hollywood to film was the actual soundstage they were using for the end the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> they just backed it up a little bit to show it was a soundstage. <laughs> But um, yeah, and that was a yeah refrain of the original song, and of course the other woman returns, and Astaire gets to dance with her, and then they're all like happy, uh, singing and dancing as they need to. And that was Holiday Inn. Before we move on to anything else, uh, what are y'all's thoughts overall of the plot? Just as as a total, that we kind of went over it more in. It was hearing a play-by-play -play of what um, was supposed to be happening without just like the glacial pacing, like bogging it down. It's like, oh, okay, this makes a little bit more sense now. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, kind of where I'll leave that. Um, like, I understand it better now, so I'm not like struggling to stay awake through it. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, it's a pretty. I want to say flat plot. Like, there's not a whole lot of uh, what I would consider excitement there. Yeah. Uh, aside from just the dance sequences, it, it sounds like it's almost just more of like a dance, a montage of dance sequences. That's how a lot of it was singing and dancing. A lot of these musicals in the 40s and 30s, well, mostly 40s. I would say that this is more on the musical genre of things with variations of dancing they would often uh, 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 one one would often go with the other and if a stair was involved there was definitely a lot of dancing involved either a stair or gene kelly <laughs> it's kind of cool that we have the, that we've covered this and white christmas now so that's kind of cool yeah i think that's uh, that, that's nice that we were able to cover both of these uh, well, let's talk a little bit about production uh, design. I know we covered a lot of music and production design as we went, but what did y'all have anything else that y'all wanted to say about the production, the uh, the effects, the uh, settings, all of that? I'd say it's pretty good, you know, for the time period and all that stuff. And I don't know if anyone's addressed this yet, and I honestly don't know. But I feel like they used the same set again for White Christmas. Is that correct? It sure looks similar. <laughs> uh, there is some, and White Christmas was originally going to uh, follow up this story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But they had for obvious reasons. It wouldn't surprise me that uh, that certain aspects of this film were actually in that film. But, but yeah. I, th I thought the production worked uh, worked for its time period as well. I mean, uh, to orchestrate the uh, the uh, the holidays at, uh, that we saw, I thought what we saw was funny. A lot of a lot of beautiful pieces, uh, a lot of great set design when they did the whenever they did the shows, they had a lot going there. Um, of course, this soundtrack was an Irving Berlin soundtrack, which meant that no other music was allowed. If you notice, when Midnight uh, struck, uh, Old Lang Syne was missing. It's not that they weren't singing that back then. It's that Irvin Berlin would not allow that. It had to be his music in the background or nothing. Egomaniac, jeez. Was everybody just like this back then? Matter of fact, there are some songs in here that were written in the teens, apparently, um, and uh, worked up. So, uh, and Berlin was a very talented composer, but um, yeah, he, he was a very jealous composer. I guess like any artist. <laughs> well, any composing artist would want would want a lot of their work to be used in the films that they're involved with. Otherwise, they wouldn't have work. But well, I yeah, mean, I, I mean, it, yeah, of course, there's that. But there's also like I think being like reasonable, and that just seems kind of. Uh, you know, I want a bowl of green M and M's. Pick all the other colors out, kind of, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, it's one thing to have all of your music uh, featured in the musical, like you have all the main songs. It's another thing to demand that every song, even songs that are in the background on the radio, all be your songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But still, a very well scored film. I say Berlin was very talented. I mean, shoot, he's written some amazing. He's written some songs that are even uh, listened to today. Well, White Christmas being one of them. And despite what's been said, I actually do think White Christmas is a beautiful song, and uh, is uh, quite a fun one to listen to during the time of year. I mean, I think I'm just sick of Christmas music in general. Well, we just got out of December. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it was like I had less patience for it than usual this year. It's like, um, like my stepdad drove me um, to my parents' house in DeKalb. It's like a two-hour drive, and I think in, I think in about the first forty-five minutes of him just blasting Christmas music, I wanted to tell the radio, "Oh my God, shut the fuck up." And I've never really felt that impulse before, so. It's also about how um, how you feel at the time of year, because there are some there are some times that the mind does not want to have anything cheery around it. Um, and of course, there's also the opposite as well, is that you know, Christmas songs also can provoke other emotions, which are not great. There's a reason why the holidays are not necessarily. The best time of year for any type of mental health. Yeah, true. Yeah, and that's coming from a professional. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why I started to put together like a large Christmas list of different songs and different variations, so that I didn't always have to listen to the same oh, yeah. Christmas music all the time. <laughs> you know. Oh, I, I I love personally Adam and his packages. Uh, what we do on Christmas, it's still one of my favorites to listen to that time of year. Um, let's see. Oh, last scenes in this and White Christmas were shot uh, on the same soundstage. Okay, that's that's that addressed your original thought, Jacob. All right. I actually had that written at the very end. Good deal. <laughs> uh, and actually, White Christmas, just as another thing about its importance, is it was the song that was requested the most 
uh, during that time of year by troops uh, in the European theater uh -huh. uh, during World War II. So, and mm -hmm. uh, Bing sang it lots of times. Uh, in a lot of ways, his, uh, his performance at the beginning of White Christmas kind of mirrored how he was in Europe at the time of the war. Makes sense. Yep. Without the fake backdrop, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anything else on uh, music or um, production? Uh, not that I know of, unless, Tammy, did you want to add anything to the production aspect of the film? I thought it was done very tastefully for that time period and there was lots of really nice nice scenery and everything i thought it was i thought it was nice and pretty and elegant at times and music wise i think the music was um very good for the time and there was a lot of nice songs in there well then why don't we go ahead to favorites? Uh, so we'll do something interesting for this. Of course, favorite scene, but we'll do two favorite Christmas songs. Uh, one old, which means anything, we'll say anything before 1970, because we're mostly a crowd that I think most of us here have existed through the 80s um, in some form or another. Uh, and of course, modern or older modern, 80s and to present. Uh, so we'll start with um, you, Jake. Well, um, so favorite, favorite scenes. Lincoln's birthday, right? <laughs> well, obviously. <laughs> no, probably, probably the first performance of White Christmas and possibly that first dance uh, between uh, uh, Astaire and, um, and uh, Reynolds, uh, or I should say, I guess, Hanover and Mason. Um, probably, I think I could probably go with those. I'm not sure that there's like a single standout scene that I would put above the others, but probably those. And you said favorite Christmas songs? Yeah, one old, so one one Christmas song that was that was uh, written prior to, say, 1980. Are, are we talking? One, so one old, one, one Are we old, talking yes. songs or are we talking recordings? Whichever. Because, well, I mean, is there, I mean, that can make a big difference. So, yeah. Well, oh, that's a, that's a tough call. I, I don't usually rank my I, I mean, I'm working really hard on my overall music list, but it don't usually include Christmas songs on the music list. So I don't really, I've never really done a ranking. Um, but if I had to just guess, <laughs> um, Let's do something a little different. This is kind of old and new, but I, I, there's a better way, I think, to break it down. Um, if you're looking at Christmas in the sense of its initial sense of being a, a religious holiday, um, you know, story of Jesus and all that, then it'd probably be a toss-up between Go Tell It on the Mountain and Mary Did You Know. I would wager. There's a couple other good choices, but those would probably be the ones that come to mind. But if we're just talking more of a secular song, um, that might also be a toss-up depending on what mood I'm in. Because... <laughs> I'm tempted to say either Clint Black's The Finest Gift or Weird Al's The Night Santa Went Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, how about you, Dave? Favorite scene? Favorite Christmas song, old and new? 
ish. I have two favorite scenes. I like the fireworks dance, and I like uh, 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 the, uh, the the car scenes where they uh, they get stuck in the mud. Uh, 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 for some reason, that part is kind of funny to me. Uh, as far as old songs, Alan Sherman's The Twelve Gifts of Christmas uh, is, is my old song. Because that actually came out in 1963. Um, and as far as a new song, New Earth song, I would go with White Christmas by The Drifters. All right. Uh, how about you, Dustin? I am not actually sure if I have any Christmas songs I like. Um, I guess maybe that really old, like, Trans-Siberian Orchestra thing. Uh, Wizards in Winter, I think is what it's called. It was playing on some commercial ones, and it's, like, the only Christmas-related music I kind of like. So, I have a stupid story that kind of ties into it, too. Like, uh, me and my friends were listening to it in undergrad in the dorm one time. I think it was, like, October or something. Because we had just remembered, oh, yeah, we should uh, we should pick that up. And we actually got a knock on our door from the RA. And we're like, all right, what do we do this time? And she was like, no Christmas music. It's not even Thanksgiving. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> and we just, like, shut the door in her face. So that's if, if I had to pick a Christmas song, I think I think that would probably be mine. That Trans Siberian Orchestra song. Well, what about favorite scene? Uh, definitely the firecracker dance because that was the first. That was really the only moment where I was like, "Oh!" and I kind of like snapped to and paid attention. Like it, it genuinely impressed me too. Well, I think if anything. Yeah, that really showcases Astaire's talent, probably the best in the film, next to the drunk scene. <laughs> <laughs> That's one that I had to rewatch again once I found out that he was fully inebriated during that scene. <laughs> I did enjoy that scene. Uh, so, what about you, Tammy? Um, for scenes, um, I, I I like when the peaches blasted off. <laughs> that was fun because <laughs> they go they both go fly. They don't know what's going on. I love the peach And um, of course the firecracker scene that that was great. Um, but I also like the the original performance of White Christmas because I it. it it just was it was sweet it was it was nice it was just it, i just thought it was a really warm and you know nice scene so favorite songs old would be being um and um Oh boy, my head doesn't want to think. <laughs> Little drummer boy. Yeah. Um, he does it with. Oh yeah, David Bowie. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen his image in my head, and the, the word, the name, just didn't want to come out. <laughs> yeah. If but anything, it's definitely worth a listen. I agree with that that's that actually is just such a weird combination. It's, but it fits so well because both of them are amazing singers. <laughs> That's my favorite old one. And newer is mine is also a TSO. It's Christmas Sarajevo. Uh, uh, yeah, my mother would definitely have put Christmas Canon in there. Uh when you'd be talking Trans Siberian. David likes Christmas Canyon too. Um so for me, my favorite scenes, I, I kind of like the refrain of the uh of the first song and kind of comparing them but i also like the whole drunk scene with the stare um which at first i was kind of annoyed by it but after after hearing about what what was going on behind the scenes for it it just made me admire it more um my favorite of the older songs uh 
I could cheat and just say the Messiah, but that's that's a lot of songs within one area. So I would say Comfort Ye uh, as the beginning, uh, with Worthy as the Lamb at the end. Both of them are very spectacular pieces. I love the intricacy, especially of Worthy as the Lamb, even though um, it's hell on the people singing it. Um, I would know on that one. Um, uh, we used to always uh, joke that Handel always hated tenors. Um, but that that piece as a whole is probably one of the most beautiful Christmas pieces ever written, in my opinion. Um, the As far as more modern, I would still say Adam and his packages, uh, what we do on Christmas, I think it's hilarious, basically. Uh, he's basically saying, it's like, <clears throat> it's like you know what what uh what the uh jews do on christmas essentially is what he says <laughs> things like it's like y'all say we all conquer are trying to conquer the world and that we got all the money well you know it means we need one day of planning you know where everybody else is busy well uh, that's christmas merry christmas buddies <laughs> <laughs> and it's just great it's a it's a hilarious tongue-in-cheek song and uh i usually play it every year at that time <laughs> So with that being said, uh, I guess that's it, and I will hand it back to you, Dave. Alrighty. So, uh, no, why don't we go around the room and t uh, t uh, tell them who we are a little, a little bit and what we do. So, uh, Dustin, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, I collect horror movie stuff here in Milwaukee, or at least I used to. Uh, I haven't been able to collect anything for a while, so I haven't uploaded for a while. Um, but we're gonna, we're still trying to get some content on on uh, the Crypt of Horrors uh, YouTube channel, which is you know my thing. Uh, but I think it's I've ended up taking kind of a year long break by accident, uh, and there's stuff I really really need to film soon. So uh, just sub to it so that I can remember that I need to do it. And uh, yeah, we'll have new stuff on there eventually. Alrighty. I have an Instagram as well, uh, the Crypt of Horrors, sit for the horror collection, and I'm on Twitter a lot as Dirk Cryptactus. Very cool. Yes. Um, Tammy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, I go on this channel with David McKenzie and another one to talk about movies with everybody. And I have my own collection and I enjoy hearing everybody else's opinions. And um, I recently started back at the workforce. So now I have something else to do until summertime when I can take out my car. All righty. Uh, heading over to you, Jake. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, I'm Godabuki Jake. I am the uh, co-host of the YouTube channel Septum Sim vs. the World. Uh, and I generally keep pretty busy um, with uh, actually uh, library work. We're, getting, we're gearing up for a big reopening, and so that's going to be... Uh, we're, we're pretty busy right now, but it's going to be real busy in a week or two, so won't that be fun? Um <laughs> But uh, I still like to, you know, make time to watch some stuff to join these fine folks uh, for discussions um, every, you know, once a week. And uh, we've got, um, I guess, my choice next week. So, you know, look forward to that. Plus, uh, got a discussion coming up on, on our channel on uh, an anime I chose called Scrap Princess. So I got that to look forward to as well. And, um, yeah, just not enough hours in the day sometimes, but, you know. <laughs> Darn straight. Okay. Heading over to you, uh, Brandon. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, well, I'm Septum Santa, Septum Sen versus the world. We do all the movie discussions and stuff about physical media. I'm trying to work on getting the channel back in order again. We have a few uh, hiccups here and there, but... Uh, I'm also uh, working to try and help uh, some others get some stuff off the ground, including my own film, Amityville Webcam, uh, which I'm currently uh, trying to uh, decide on 
uh, continuing to look for other distributors or to self-distribute. Um, but I've got a plan for both and uh, still working on that, uh, helping uh, Dave with um, uh, Tales of the Forgotten, Act 1 and 2. And, uh, of course, uh, hopefully once all that's done, uh, I'll be able to definitely hit a regular schedule. Uh, we are also working on um, a series. We're also working with the uh, Schlockaholics, which uh, is a group of people that we like to talk about the schlocky stuff that uh, sometimes uh, gets left behind. And we had uh, a really cool uh, um, Herschel Gordon Lewis um, uh, discussion uh, that we had for Color Me Blood Red, which we were both kind of like uh, disappointed by, but um, there's plenty of that catalog to go. And we're going to be covering Amityville Apocalypse uh, this weekend which actually has a number of people here in it. Uh, myself, uh, having directed two of the shorts in the film, and uh, Dave and uh, Jake actually uh, acting in it. So uh, that's going to be a fun discussion. Okay. Uh, and uh, my name is David Stregi. I'm one of the uh, founding fathers of Inside Movies Galore, so thank you for coming along with us on this fantabulous journey that we, uh, we've been having. We are almost done with the the uh, holiday second chances uh, month. So um, uh, we're having a blast doing that. But uh, uh, I also moonlight on a different channel where um, uh, we, we've uh, done two episodes on uh, delusions of grandeur. Um, we did a discussion on Wolf with uh, Jack Nicholson uh, uh, involved in it. And we also uh, uh, did uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night on um, uh, uh, just this past uh, Sunday. So um, definitely check out some of those uh, episodes. I, I think I had a blast do, uh, doing that with uh, some of the rest. Um, so um, looking forward to uh, uh, discussing next week's uh, d uh, discussion, which will be, uh, probably be Violent Night. So, um, uh, that uh, that being said, uh, Brandon's been helping me edit uh, the uh, the anthology series of films that um, uh, uh, that we I, I believe tonight we have actually pretty much finished. Uh, don't think there's anything more that we, that we need to add to it. Is there, Brandon? That, uh, that we know? Just the special features. Yeah. So uh, uh, just putting together the bonus features and what, whatnot, and we will actually probably have a master copy of it of the first one at least. And it's coming in. Uh, I'll tell you this: uh, on uh, at least around two hours and fifty minutes, which isn't bad. So um, that being said. Um, I also uh, go on and talk about films of my own nature on Delusions of Grandeur channel. Uh, and from time to time, do some pickup videos. So check out uh, the, the, the channel and uh, check out this channel. Let us know down in the comments what you thought of our uh, discussion. And we're definitely going to be continued uh, in to chug along uh, to uh you know, discussing different films uh, for, uh, from time to time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited um, that uh, some of the fruitations of my labor of work uh, in film is actually getting somewhere. So uh, thank you, Brandon. And uh, we'll have to l uh, let you all know when, when we actually do release the film. So yeah. uh, definitely... Uh, now, what is next week's choice? Jacob. Jacob, why don't you tell us what next week's uh, film will be? Well, apparently, um, uh, my initial choice had to change because apparently we didn't uh, get the full uh, communication of what the theme was for the month. So, with limited options, I decided my second chances holiday movie is going to be the Robert Zemeckis version of 
A Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey. Uh, just to see if a second viewing will um, make it uh, feel a little better than the first viewing did. <laughs> okay. We'll Looking see. forward to that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, honestly, uh, and, uh, I know that it was playing a lot during these last uh, holidays, so I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what the public thinks about that particular adaptation, since there are many adaptations of The Christmas Carol out there. Oh, I don't hear people talk about it much. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I've seen that before. Uh, but uh, it should be interesting. So um, like, share, and subscribe, and everyone say good night. And uh, uh, whoever's enjoying their new year, just have a happy new year. Um, since yep. we're still go coming into the <coughs> beginning. Well, <laughs> good night. Right, all. What's a nut?